Hi, this is Larry Keane. I'm going to be the first of a series of presentations on low-pass sequence data and its use in genetic evaluation. And I'm going to be introducing a joint project between the University of Nebraska at Lincoln and the U.S. Meat Animal Research Center. Uh, my topic will be just the introduction of what the project will entail overall. And after me, Warren Snelling will be talking about uh, some preliminary results with low-pass sequencing and its use in, uh, in predicting genotypes as a potential for replacing the array data that most of us currently use right now. Mark Tallman will follow that and be uh, bouncing off some ideas of what we think we could start to use with this type of data in actual genetic evaluation programs and where are some of the pathways that we'll be uh, going forward with as we develop this system. So as most of you are aware, current, uh, currently genetic evaluation relies on genotyping arrays uh, to produce genomically enhanced EPDs. These genotyping arrays generally have between 20,000 and 100,000 different markers, depending on what genotype the array is being used by different breed associations or different genetic service providers. And these Arrays are then imputed to a certain set of markers that are utilized as the primary tools for inserting uh, genetic evaluate, inserting marker information into genetic evaluation. This insertion into genomic, into forming genomically enhanced EPDs uh, is done using a single step approach, uh, generally using methods that replace, that form a G matrix as a replacement for a pedigree relationship matrix. And most of the time, these approaches are unweighted such that each of the markers that are being used in the set to make the G matrix are have, have an equal contribution to that G matrix. These markers may or may not be based on a reduced set of markers. There are current evaluation programs that use approximately 50,000 markers analogous to the 50 the original 50K marker data set that's been available for a number of years now. There's other programs that are now using somewhere between two and 4,000, I believe, markers to uh, make a G matrix off of that reduced set. And those markers have been chosen to be more, uh, more, more uh, beneficial to the genetic evaluation, higher accuracy than using all markers simultaneously. This, this approach rarely takes advantage of other knowledge in the markers uh, that might not contribute to the phenotypic information alone. For instance, most of the time this approach does not take advantage of knowledge of variants that are functional or other possible causal variants that could be playing a role in the phenotypes that we're interested in genetic evaluation. So what are functional variants? Um, functional variants are based off of tools from gene annotation that actually help us understand what the uh, what kind of polymorphisms are contained within coding regions of genes on the genome. Um, right now, most of the markers that have been chosen for these uh, genotyping arrays have been chosen such that the markers would be uh, somewhere in an intermediate frequency uh, and approximately equally spaced across the genome. So uh, choosing markers that actually may code for gene function has generally not been a goal. One of the exceptions to that was the uh, F250K chip developed in collaboration with the University of Missouri for a grant project on facility there where they were actually looking at protein coding regions and polymorphisms that would change the protein or actually cause loss of function in proteins such that the proteins were not actually formed. Uh, so basically, uh, the functional variants um, are a tool that we could use uh, to actually look at what these uh, polymorphisms might actually be changing in the expression of genes and actually see if some of those places where proteins change or where they're not created at all might actually be impacting our trait complexes in genetic evaluation. So 
one, as we go into this, we're not going in blindly. We've looked at the F-250 uh, chip on some of the data here. This is an analysis from Warren Snelling. And he looked at uh, polymorphisms that we were seeing in the germ plasma evaluation, which is GPE in this slide, at the US Meat Animal Research Center. And he did uh, a series of analyses, one of which was based on using all markers on the F250 kit chip that were shared with the original 50K uh, genotyping array, of which there were around 33,000, almost 34,000. And if he used all of that, um, he saw a good genomic heritability with that and some transferability of results from GPE to some other populations. The SFA is another, is a selection for functional alleles. It's another population we have at the Mean Animal Research Center made up of some composites and of purebred Angus. He checked it in red Angus populations that we had some availability with from the Weight Traits Project and some similar type. Uh, Simital uh, animals that we also had from the Weight Traits Project. And you can see, yes, results did transfer. We were getting accuracy in all three of those populations when we used everything. But if he did a preliminary analysis and only picked markers that had significant uh, GWAS, uh, genome wide association study results, in the GPE population, the heritability in the GPE population dropped a fair bit, but we actually did as well or better using that same G matrix off of those reduced sets in these evaluation populations. So accuracy was actually increased. And even more uh, interesting with this trade birth weight, uh, when we used um, 12 of the highest uh, uh, effects uh, functional variants, that were also selected for having low LD with other functional variances that were significant. Uh, so actually representing unique signals, we did just as well in terms of accuracy being transferable across the population. Indeed, one marker alone actually explained a huge amount of variance, and that's a known growth marker in CAPG that's on chromosome uh, six, I believe. So small sets of functional variants can really explain meaningful phenotypic variation within or across populations. And obviously this is an easy example, birth weight. We haven't necessarily reproduced these same types of results on all trait complexes. But what this does is it gives us hope that trying to actually uh, uh, trim down sets of markers into functional sets of markers that may affect uh, uh, gene, tr gene transcription and translation could actually be a useful tool to selecting which, which markers may be the most important in our genetic evaluation program. So while the F250 chip did give us a good idea of how functional variants uh, might be very usable in genetic evaluation, there are some inherent problems with the F250 chip alone. Um, so F250 basically implies there's 250,000 different markers on that chip, but some of those were very, very low frequency in our US MARP populations, which is a very diverse population with a lot of different breeds represented. We were only able to see uh, actual variation in allele frequency uh, instead of a fixed allele in about uh, 120,000 of those variants. So that's quite a bit lower. And if we were targeting loss of function genes that were on that original chip, um, there were only 300 or 703 uh, different loss of function allele changes of the original targeted 50 or 5,751 loss of function polymorphisms that were designed on the chip that we actually saw anymore. And that only represented around 651 genes. So a, a substantial drop from the original design of the F250. Um, in terms of, of, of actual markers that cause protein changes, we dropped from almost 95,000 designed on the chip to around 32,000 that uh, remained and as being variable in our population. 
and only around 15,000 potential regulatory SNP remain. So a lot of a lot of different genes are missing. If we're only representing around 651 and a little over 10,000 genes in the whole genome, realize that there's at least twice as many genes of that generally thought to be on the bovine uh, annotation. So we're missing a whole lot of genes that that if they weren't producing the same proteins you would expect from that gene. Uh, we may not be seeing what we would expect. So this, this low-pass sequencing that I'm talking about has a new potential to help us out. Um, basically, what this process is, is, is doing genotyping instead of by arrays, doing it by sequencing animals at a low coverage. So it's a lot cheaper. And when we sequence across the genome like that, we're able to identify somewhere around 40 to 60 million different variants on the whole genome, and those variants being polymorphisms that perhaps we could exploit down the road. And those are found in uh, potentially in all of those animals using this low pass. The cost has been scaled down. We don't need even one egg coverage per animal. In fact, what Warren will show you later is, is using coverages that are closer to a half X coverage or less. And basically what's done in order to do this, that, that wouldn't be enough information by itself, but we're able to use reference haplotypes from fully sequenced animals with higher coverage to identify haplotypes that are out there in all of the different breeds. And based on that haplotype library and reference, we can impute to these 40 to 60 million variant uh, polymorphisms that are across spaced across the whole genome. This is also tied to low pass or skin sequencing sometime and we're seeing accuracy of genotype calls upward of 99% on many breeds and Warren will cover this a lot more in a lot more depth in the next uh, in the next presentation. So currently we're, we're entering into a project with the University of Nebraska Lincoln and the current objectives of this project then are enhancing the portability of genomic predictors and increasing the accuracy of genomic predictors using uh, low pass sequencing and basically accomplishing these goals by evaluating the use of that low pass sequencing and the, and the large amount of, uh, of markers that we're seeing, polymorphisms that we're seeing in that and using those in genetic evaluation systems. So the current plan is to uh, increase genotyping on both population on on UNL populations and two different populations that were already mentioned earlier: the Germ Plasma Evaluation Program or GPE and the Selection for Functional Alleles Population or SFA, and basically evaluate accuracy gains from evaluating new marker sets from this low-pass sequencing. And we'll be genotyping all of these population using a combination of low pass sequencing, which still isn't quite as cheap as, as buying genotyping arrays. Um, and so we're, we're basically going to take representative animals and use and, and run them with low coverage sequencing and then fill in the rest of the animals with, with a, a lower density array and impute low coverage sequencing polymorphisms to the whole population using standard pedigree imputation and haplotype imputation software programs. Right now we're targeting around 5,000 animals a year in each of the two population. Uh, part of UNLs is based on an earlier Nebraska Beef Systems project and that includes uh, all UNL cow herds as well as animals entering UNL on feedlots. We'll be genotyping another 5,000 animals from U.S. Mino Research Center every year. Again, car reading those two populations and any commercial populations we are observing at the U.S. Mino Research Center that could have some important phenotypes to follow up with. Uh, you guys have seen slides like this. If you've seen us talk about the germ plasma evaluation program and just just to see, as you know, uh, we have a whole lot of traits that we typically measure in this program and report back for uh, getting breed differences or genomic effects on several of these traits. We, uh, we want to evaluate many of these because many of these are economically relevant traits that are not that well represented in uh, 
in genetic evaluation programs now and help maybe gain a foothold to make some of these traits that are currently novel in genetic evaluation become less novel by so showing that there are places where a uh, little investment in phenotyping might be worthwhile for the breed association. So analysis uh, of all of this data is not straightforward. We've talked a lot about the number of markers uh, being way over the number of animals when we first started talking about uh, 50K chips uh, more than 10 years ago. Well, now we're talking about uh, tens of millions of different variants that we're seeing, and there's no way we have enough animals genotype to, to actually have the number of animals be greater than the number of polymorphisms. So we need to design strategies that give prior weighting to different marker types, like the functional variances I, I told about earlier, I talked about earlier, or regulatory variants or, or things like that, basically classify variants and, and assign different uh, structures of, of, uh, of the total genotypic variance to each of these different classes to see if it's worthwhile breaking up the marker sets into things that we think are more likely to affect the traits we're interested in. This includes funding for this plan that we have includes funding for research support in a joint venture between the institutions as well as some outside collaborators that are that are uh, helping out and, and have interest in this, including uh, uh, the uh, GeneSeq, who's helping us with genotype, and Jankov, who's helping us with a lot of that imputation uh, using reference populations on these, uh, on these uh, uh, low-pass sequencing data sets. Mark Tallman will talk about some of the initial ideas for this program and what we're going to do with analyses in more depth uh, after Warren. So there could be some byproducts from this that might come out. Um, there's some potential uh, beyond just improving accuracy of genetic evaluation for us to start to look at extension, uh, look at those novel traits I mentioned earlier and what can we do to improve and get uh, genome-wide association studies using low-pass sequencing on several of those novel traits. Basically, uh, uh, the extension of novel traits to genetic evaluation de will depend on how successful are we are with weight traits that we know are already part of the genetic evaluation system and realize our primary goal here is increasing the utility of genetic evaluation. So the most important strategy that the whole industry can do uh, to help with the novel traits is to try to make them less novel and improve phenotypic schemes in the industry as much as possible. Another byproduct of this as it comes out is as we talk about replacing the arrays that are currently out there with low pass sequencing, we will start to understand the imputation and storage requirements for low coverage sequence and be able to help inform those types of decisions with several of the genetic service providers and breed associations. So with that, I'll close this portion of the talk and uh, turn things over to Warren Snelling. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate the opportunity to visit with you some today about low-pass sequencing and what, it, what we think it might do in, for genetic evaluation. And I sure appreciate everyone who's still sticking around for this final session. Um, hope you get something out of out of it. You know what I'd like to do today is cover a little bit about genome sequencing and more on what we're trying to do to evaluate low-pass sequencing before we put a, put a lot into running low-pass on large numbers of animals. It would be great if we could read the sequence of a chromosome from one end to the other. If we could, two passes would get complete sequence of both strands of DNA, and we could determine genotypes of all sequence variation that an individual carries. Sequencing machines aren't quite there yet. Right now we need to cut the DNA into random fragments, then sequence ends of those fragments. There are some long-read sequencers that can read several thousand consecutive bases, 
but most of what we do is with what we call short reads, you know, somewhere, you know, 50 to 300 bases or so. Um, you know, a lot of what we do in low passes around 150 bases. And we can align those to a reference genome and identify differences between reads from an individual and the reference sequence to call genotypes. We used low coverage sequence when we first started sequencing in germplasm evaluation project. Um, you know, in, in that effort, we thought we could discover more variation by sequencing lots of bulls at low coverage instead of a handful at, at high coverage. The higher coverage we could have called genotypes on the bulls we did sequence, but at low coverage, we thought we could discover more var variation and fig and find the interesting variants and figure out some other way to genotype those variants across the population. The G the GPE bull sequence project got us thinking about custom chips and targeted sequencing as a way to genotype the interesting variants we were finding in sequence. But then we saw some evidence from low pass sequencing that really got us more interested in this approach. Um, you know, with the low pass, we, we can't call genotypes directly from that sequence, but there's some human work that shown that it can be quite effective, you know, at least in humans and with a good reference database and some initial work on cattle samples we got showed, showed a lot of promise that, so we started looking more at low pass to get the genotypes we're really interested in. Before generating low coverage sequence to impute a large number of calves, we wanted to evaluate the approach by downsampling some existing sequence to mimic what we can do with low pass. We did this in collaboration with Joe Pickerel and the group at GenCove. You know, the imputation reference panel that they have assembled in, includes publicly available whole genome sequence from several sources, as well as sequence that we've generated from the germplasm evaluation project. You know, right now the panel has almost a thousand animals representing a wide variety of beef and dairy breeds. Um, they're, the breeds are listed in order of representation in the panel, um, about 40% is split between Angus and Holstein. You know, and then there are some of these categories where the crossbred and composite includes composite breeds developed in 
the U.S. and Canada, as well as some of the crossbred animals that we sequenced for GPE. And there's some others that the other category is purebreds that are representing a number of breeds that, that only have a handful of animals in the reference. You know, there is a pretty good set of Brahmin cattle in this, as well as, you know, a few of the American breeds, Santa Gertrudis, Beefmaster, and Brangus. You know, nearly 60 million variants were detected in the sequence of these animals in the reference. According to annotation of the bovine assembly, the vast majority are endogenic or intronic and not expected to affect coding sequence. You know, there are 660,000 that look a lot more interesting that might change the actually change the protein or at least regulate how much of a protein is produced. A handful of those are what we call high impact um, loss of loss of function that could you know either silence a gene or cause a major change in that function of that gene and you know then Another 300,000 or so are non-synonymous and will change the protein se amino acid sequence of a protein. Then about the same number are in regulatory regions that might affect how much is, of a gene is produced. And then there's some variation in non-coding RNA that may also have a regulatory effect. Our evaluation of low pass started with down sampling bulls we had used in GPE. One bull from each of the cycle seven breeds, Angus, Red Angus, Hereford, Charlay, Gelby, Limousin, and Simmental, plus a Brahmin, Beefmaster, Brangus, and Santa Gertudis bull were identified. Between less than half an X up to 2x worth of the sequence we had from those bulls were randomly sampled and genotypes imputed from the downsampled sequence. We also used a set of in intensely studied steers having extreme high or low intake and gain on the finishing rations. These steers had been sequenced to about 10x and were downsampled to 1x. The imputed bull genotypes were, were compared to their genotypes from the high density chip. Correlations between imputed and chip genotypes were generally greater than 0.9 for the torus bulls and then increased slightly with higher coverage. Imputation accuracy was a bit less for, for the Brahmin bull between 0.98 at 0.4x up to 0.99 at 2x. Lowest accuracy was for the composite Beefmaster, Brangus, and Santa Gertudis bulls. Accuracy for these breeds might be increased by in increasing re representation in the reference panel.
We also looked at genomic prediction with, the, with these theories. The GPE records without the steers were used to train marker effects on birth weight, post weaning gain, and marbling score. MBV for the steers were predicted by applying those marker effects to the steers genotypes, both chip genotypes and the genotypes imputed from sequence. And the MBV were compared to the steers EBV from pedigree and genomic block that did include the steers records. Three sets of marker effects were solved for each trait. One was the usable functional variance from the GGP F250 chip. A second set was a subset of a few hundred markers from the F250. And the third set was the 50K overlap between the F250 and high density and F F250 chips. Agreement between MBV predicted with these marker effects and the steers GBLUP EBV were stronger than agreement with pedigree EBV. Agreement for the F250 and 50K were similar. The small F250 subsets explain less than the large marker sets, but still explain a substantial amount of variation in these traits. Agreement using the chip genotypes was a bit higher than agreement with imputed genotypes, which is probably because genotypes for some of the chip SNP were missing from imputed genotypes. You know, and we, one other data set we looked at is something we just received last week um, and haven't had a whole lot of time to explore. But these were from a set of UNL cattle imputed from half X sequence. All were purebred Angus or rather black Sam Angus females. At this point, we don't have other genotypes for comparison, but did apply the call confidence metric to the imputed genotype probabilities. Call confidence for these girls is generally lower than what we saw for the steers, but none of these cattle have the extremely low call confidence that would, might indicate DNA problems like we did find with the steers. So far, everything we've seen from downsampling is pretty encouraging. Imputation from low coverage sequence appears to be pretty accurate. It's not perfect, but one feature of the imputation is that it can recognize where it's not going to impute well and has reflected in the genotype probabilities. We might improve accuracy by expanding the reference panel and another round of imputation that might include pedigree to impute the low probability genotypes. With low pass, we can impute genotypes for a comprehensive set of variants detected in the reference panel. Not that we're ever going to use all 600 million in an evaluation, but we can extract interesting subsets to use for the evaluations. Most immediately, the 50K can be pulled out and used with existing chip data, like just like we do in current evaluations. As, as we learn more about which variants are more likely to affect performance, the 50K SNP by, might be replaced with probable causal variants, reducing the dependence on within breed LD to enable more accurate prediction across different breeds, crosses, and generations. Right now, the cost of low-pass sequencing and imputation is competitive with SNP chips, but low-pass can provide much more information. Developments in library prep and sequencing costs may reduce costs even more, which could 
encourage more complete genotyping to reduce, reduce bias and increase accuracy of genetic evaluations. Lower cost and more accurate predictions across breeds and crossbred cattle might also help to justify genotyping commercial calves. Commercial data could be included in national cattle evaluation and genomic predictions on commercial cattle might support calf management and marketing decisions. The big advantage we see for low pass with imputation instead of chips is that we can genotype interesting variants without, without all the issues related to custom chips. We can implement low pass in GPE and other research populations right away at a fraction of the cost it would take to do a chip with just some of the variants that we'd like to genotype. Even with collaborations, we wouldn't have the volume needed for a low-cost low chip, and some of the genotype calls from a chip might be questionable until we have enough data to really train, train the calls on the chip. With low pass, we don't have to worry about using up chips with limited shelf life or variants that are missing from the chip because probes for those variants are not designable. All this does not mean that we're completely satisfied with imputation from low pass. One particular concern is accuracy of imputing genotypes for genetic defects. We need to know the sequence variants causing the defect, and the reference panel needs to include defect carriers to have any chance of low-pass sequence matching haplotypes with the defect alleles. Lower accuracy of Brahmin-influenced composite bulls and steers suggest a need for more indicants influence in the reference panel. Additional expansion of the reference panel might be suggested by genomic relationships among commercial cattle and the reference panel. Right now we have a summer student working on, on that using genotypes provided by Neogen and the genome GenCove reference panel. Eventually we need a systematic approach to identify the holes in the reference monitoring genotype probabilities of calves going through the amputation pipeline might indicate groups needing additional reference. We also need to revisit amputation from chip genotypes to sequence variants so we can leverage the existing chip genotypes. For this, pedigree amputation to a large reference panel genotype with low pass might be more accurate than imputing to a relatively small set of sequenced bulls. Overall, we're encouraged by the possibilities Lowe's low pass offers for genetic evaluation, but there's still room for improvement. None of this would have been possible without a lot of help. iGenomics deserves a big thank you for introducing us to Low Pass. GenCove has been really instrumental both in constructing the reference panel and developing an imputation pipeline. You know, we've received some challenges and ideas and support from GeneSeq, and then the whole entire operation at Clay Center, everyone from the cattle crews through the core lab doing the sequencing have made all of this possible. Thank you. Hi, I'm Mark Tallman. I want to visit with you about opportunities for low-pass sequencing of pedigree populations and how it may fit into genomic evaluation. With current genomic EPDs, we assume markers are spread evenly across the genome in intermediate frequencies or are selected from such, such markers. We assume some markers may directly affect traits, but know that most do not. We assume causative variation is closely associated with markers. We assume all genotyped animals either have or can be imputed to a common set of markers. 
The one thing we can be pretty confident of is that current genomic predictions are more accurate than predictions without genomics. With the current approach to genomic EPDs, we could expect to get a limited increase in accuracy from improving utilization of the markers that are on the current chips. We could expect to get an additional limited increase in accuracy from increasing the number of markers of the same type as what are on the current chips. But the high hanging fruit is causative variation not on current chips that often has low minor allele frequency. There are millions of candidates and only limited opportunities for prioritizing them without having genotypes to evaluate their effects. Nonetheless, Warren has shown benefits of screening putative functional variants from a relatively small subset of the entire pool of such variants. Our current default approach to improving the accuracy of genomic predictions is something like the, follows, the following. We sequence influential bulls within the population. We look for variants within that sequence. We impute that sequence to descendants of these influential bulls using chips of a variety of densities. Within that data, we identify the most promising sequence variants to improve accuracy of the predictions. We use functional information and preliminary associations with traits where possible. And then we develop new, new chips that include these promising new variants. We determine which of the promising variants appear most predictive in our evaluations. We include those most predictive variants in the next generation of prediction models and in future chips. And then we repeat the process. If this looks hard, that's because the high hanging fruit is most of what is left to do and it is hard. But Matt Spanger calls this iterative redesign of chips untenable when considered in the context of low pass sequencing as an alternative. Low pass sequencing is sequencing a random sample of the genome of an animal to low coverage in lieu of genotyping a specific set of markers. The short term goal is to impute to the standard set of markers used in the current analyses at cost that's competitive with genotyping. The intermediate goal is to identify markers that are more predictive of important traits and the long-term goal is to replace genotyping by imputing an entire population to full genomic sequence. By comparison, chip genotyping provides high accuracy and call rate without imputation, whereas low pass requires imputation for both. Chip genotypes give us both the paternal and maternal alleles, whereas low pass may impute the paternal allele but not the maternal or vice versa. Chips are focused on genotypes, whereas low pass is focused on haplotypes. And chip genotyping is a mature technology, whereas low pass is in early stages of development. There are legitimate concerns over low pass sequencing. First is how it will integrate with existing SNP chips and the subsets of them used in current genetic evaluations. Warren's shown that it is feasible to get good marker genotypes, but that there are limits on that. Secondly, will genetic defects and other must-have variants such as polled and red-black be reported reliably? But there are several approaches available to enhance the representation of specific loci within the library. Low-pass does require imputation to produce a useful result, but imputation is already part of the genomic evaluation pipeline. The imputation required for low-pass is more sophisticated than that currently used, but Warren has shown that 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 also is feasible. And finally, will it work for parentage determination? Well, SNP chips are great for parentage determination, but low pass is going to be even better. So why consider low pass sequencing? It will make the process of SNP discovery, promising variant identification, adding them to the evaluation, validating them in field data, getting rid of the dropouts, returning to SNP discovery and repeating far more seamless, continuous, and less time consuming and iteratively redesigning SNP chips. The current cost is somewhat greater than that of 50K chips, but it may decrease to below SNP chips. SNP discovery will be far more thorough than if it's limited to higher coverage of relatively few influential bulls. I'm going to take you through an example that I hope will help you better understand the differences between chip genotypes and low-pass sequence and also understand how we can generate near complete sequence from low pass data. To do that, I'm going to use a hypothetical pedigree comprised of a founder siren dam, two full sib progeny of them, and a son of the two full sibs. I do not mean to imply that the actual animals of which these photos were taken are related. 
To the right of each photo is a hypothetical sequence of that animal with the sequence inherited from its sire above this sequence inherited from its dam. We're going to take a microscopic view of the genome and focus on a hypothetical region spanned by three consecutive markers of a 50K chip. But everything we do within that small region would be happening simultaneously throughout the remainder of the genome and in regions spanned by another 50,000 or so markers scattered throughout it. To help remind us of that, there are ellipses at the ends of the sequence that represent the sequences between the ends of the region and the ends of the chromosome that is on. The total length of the sequences represented by the two ellipses would be on the order of 100 million bases for an average bovine chromosome. By bases, I mean the fundamental building blocks of DNA, which take four forms that we represent by the letters A, C, G, and T. This region of the genome that we are going to focus on would typically be about 100,000 bases in length, or 0.1% of the length of the chromosome on which it resides. The locations of the 350K markers are highlighted in yellow, and we also assume a variant that directly affects a trait of importance to us that is highlighted in blue. Now we're going to zoom in on a few hundred bases that surround each of the 50K markers in the causative variant. There are four such segments on the slide, separated by tildes. Each tilde represents constant and variable sequence that is important, but too long to represent on the slide generally greater than 10,000 bases in length. Within each of these several hundred base segments, we will further focus on the positions that are variable within our population. They are the ones that are represented by letters. And then we have the dashes, which represent sequence that is the same within column, but different between columns. The differences between columns are important in that they help us determine where in the genome the sequence resides. Before we leave this slide comparing chip genotypes with low-pass sequence, I want to ensure that everyone understands some of our jargon. A genotype is the pair of bases that an animal has at a specific position in the genome. A haplotype is a string of bases along a chromosome that all have the same parent of origin. So the genotype of the first bull at the first marker is GA. His paternal haplotype is a row of blue letters, and his maternal haplotype is a row of green letters. The 50K chip gives us the information in the yellow columns, whereas low pass will give us most of the information on the slide. I'm going to go through the example fairly quickly and try to emphasize the main points that I want you to take home from it. There may be a few of you who want to watch it again at your own pace and get into the weeds and gain a deeper understanding. If you fall into that category, please read the disclaimers on this slide. This slide shows a representation of low-pass sequencing reads for the first three animals in our example. Each contiguous string of letters and dashes represents one sequencing read, which would typically be several hundred bases in length. It's not possible in this diagram to show how spread out these reads would be across the genome, so see Warren's uh, diagram for a better idea of what that would look like. Warren mentioned that having a good panel of reference haplotypes is important for imputation of low-pass data. Here we have an example set of reference haplotypes that are comprised of three haplotypes present in our founder individuals and one haplotype in red from outside the pedigree. But the reference set is missing the cow's maternal haplotype, which I've shown below the reference panel. In the middle of the slide, we have the low-pass reads from the founder cow from the previous slide. And we can see that the reads that are purple match exactly with the purple reference haplotype. So we just copy the purple haplotype down from the reference panel to the cow's imputed genome sequence. And we see that the two gold reads on the left half of the slide match exactly with the red reference haplotype. So we copy that down to the cow's imputed sequence below. But we find that the gold reads on the right half of the slide don't match at all with the red haplotype or any other haplotype in the reference panel for that matter. So we are not able to impute the sequence on the right half of her maternal genome. So we can fill in the positions that were directly read by the sequencer, but we are unable to impute the other positions. So we use dots to represent the unknown bases in those positions. Careful comparison of the red and gold haplotypes reveals two positions in which they differ. And that introduces two imputation errors in the cow's maternal haplotype. We will track that as we go through the example and see later how to resolve it. So what if we use the pedigree in imputation? If the parents have reasonably complete and accurate sequence imputed, we can do a lot. 
To demonstrate this, we will add sparse coverage to the bottom two animals. By sparse, I mean lo lower coverage at lower cost than low pass, with reeds correspondingly spaced farther apart. To start the process, we need sequence reads that can be assigned unambiguously to only one of the four copies of this chromosome segment within each animal's two parents. A fraction of reads meet that criteria, but those that do tell us whether this region of the genome was inherited from the animal sire or dam and whether it was the parent's paternal or maternal copy. In doing so, it tells us which reference haplotype the reed should be assigned to and by extension, which other animals in the pedigree are identical by descent to it. The reeds shown for the bottom two animals meet this criteria with one exception that I will describe in a minute. Fortunately, we only need relatively few reeds this informative to do powerful pedigree-based imputation. The power of this imputation is hidden in the colors of the ellipses at each end of this region. They indicate identity by descent in the region immediately adjacent to the one being considered. In the case of the black cow, suppose it reads that can be attributed to her sire in both regions adjacent to this one in the diagram consistently match his green maternal haplotype and not his blue one. Then the ellipses on each end are colored green and it is safe to assume that everything between them is from the green haplotype because the odds of a double recombination would be on the order of one in a million. If the ellipses are different colors, a recombination occurred and things are a bit more complicated. But that is only expected in about one out of a thousand regions of this size. This approach does depend on the sequence haplotypes of the parents being sufficiently complete. Here the progeny haplotypes are imputed by copying the appropriate parental haplotypes and highlighting them in light green. The paternal haplotype of the red bull has a new crossover in addition to the crossover that occurred in his sire. The purple and green reads represent the closest points to the crossover where parental origin can be determined, so the interval between them is colored gray to indicate ambiguity of origin, and only the positions where the two parental haplotypes agree are filled with base calls. The sequence data generated by sparse coverage provides information to fill gaps and fix errors in the ancestors. Essentially, wherever haplotypes are identical by descent, information can be shared between them. In the case of the imputation errors, information from two sources was contradictory, so both were set to missing to be resolved later with yet more information. After having sequenced three animals with the gold haplotype at low or sparse coverage, it could be added to the reference panel. Even with some gaps and potentially undetected errors, Imputing animals identical by descent to these with the gold haplotype in the reference would probably produce more accurate results than imputing with the red haplotype as the best option for them. This, this example was contrived to generate problems and to show how they could be solved. Both were exaggerated due to the constraint of having room to show five animals with 24 variable positions across a region spanning 100,000 bases. What this example completely failed to demonstrate, and I have to ask you to imagine, is the power that a couple dozen progeny per bull with sparse coverage would have to fill gaps, resolve errors, and identify new haplotypes to be added to the reference. So off-the-shelf low-pass works amazingly well. Could work better and be less expensive with pedigree information. The advantages are far greater if the entire herd or population is sequenced than if just a few. And low pass captures far more genetic variation than current chips can. Most sequencing of cattle has made the simplifying assumption of a common reference sequence, which has usually been of one particular Hereford cow. Although we've known for a long time that there's variation in the structure of cattle genomes, until recently it's been one of many complications that were not feasible to deal with. My colleague Tim Smith is leading a collaborative effort to characterize structural variation by long read sequencing the genomes of individuals representing many diverse breeds of cattle with the objective of constructing a pangenome of cattle. This slide attempts to illustrate the concept with hypothetical structural variation between and within several diverse breeds. The pangenome is a collection of all sequences that can be found in cattle while the core genome is a set of sequences that all cattle share. Markers that are candidates for chip genotyping are typically screened for call rate, which is the proportion of animals for which genotypes that follow Mendelian segregation can be reliably produced. This would exclude most markers outside the core genome, so most markers on current chips are probably in the core genome. In contrast, all the DNA in the genome is subject to low-pass sequencing. 
When it comes to structural variation, we're just getting started in cattle. There's much more we don't know than what we do know. We do know some genes that vary in copy number. It seems likely there are at least some genes that are expressed in some animals and absent in others. Such genes seem likely to contribute to functional variation. The problem of missing heritability is that there's some variation that we know is heritable, but we can't find it with current genomic approaches. It seems likely that uh, structural variation contributes to the uh, missing heritability. Structural variation is detected much more effectively through long read technology than with the short reads used in low pass. But once detected and added to reference haplotypes, it should be feasible to impute structural variation with short read low pass sequence generated currently. And so that emphasizes one of the advantages of low pass, which is that we don't need to know what we're looking for before we run the assay. And, and that's a huge advantage. Larry told you that we're initiating a pilot project uh, in collaboration with the University of Nebraska in which we're going to add low-pass sequence to populations at uh, UNL and several populations at US Mark. And I'm going to give you a little bit more detail on what we're doing within the germplasm evaluation project. We have already sequenced almost 400 sires that are influential in the project, comprising 20 breeds at 2 to 4x uh, depth of coverage. Those have already contributed to the uh, reference haplotypes that are being used along with other sources. And much of that sequence is on sire sun pairs to enhance uh, the efficiency of haplotyping. We've genotyped much of the GP population already with chips of various densities. We've prioritized 3,000 animals for low pass sequencing and several thousand others for additional low density chips. The animals designated for low pass are those expected to fill the most holes in the reference haplotypes. When we get all this data back, we'll evaluate the quality of imputation. We'll do additional sequencing to fill the most important holes in the reference and we'll develop analyses to utilize the imputed sequence to identify predictive markers not on the chips and improve genomic predictions. So one of our objectives is to provide information that could inform decisions about whether, when, and how the beef industry might transition into low-pass sequencing for uh, genetic evaluations. And so our uh, best guess at a strategy for that is, obviously we would begin with a collection of reference haplotypes that's appropriate for the populations to be evaluated. Uh, then use low pass instead of chips as it becomes cost, of, cost competitive to do so or can be demonstrated to provide sufficient accuracy to justify the cost. Verify that the concerns listed above are addressed, especially that uh, we're continuing to get good genotypes for the marker loci that would still be involved in the or required for the genetic evaluation. We want to evaluate quality of imputation and accuracy of prediction. And then collect additional sequence on those individuals that would most effectively fill the most important holes in the reference sequence. Our short-term goals under this strategy would be to keep the current marker sets and models until low pass comprises a substantial proportion of the data and to monitor the quality of imputed genotypes for those markers. Then we take a two-pronged approach, the first of which is to identify and sequence influential ancestors, which if low pass sequenced would provide imputed sequence to the greatest number of phenotyped individuals. And the second prong is to use non-production genetic evaluation runs to continuously screen for variants not in the model that have the greatest predictive ability. And continuously but gradually add loci with the greatest predictive ability to the model and drop those that are least predictive. That would include loci outside the core genome and we would give extra emphasis to functional and putative regulatory SNPs. Simultaneously with that, we would impute the genotypes of loci that are in the production genomic evaluation model but not included on chips 
back to those animals that are genotyped only with chips so that they could also be evaluated to some extent based on those, those additional loci. Okay, we're just about to the conclusion. So if you've hung in with me this far, don't quit if you happen to hear some jargon in this slide that's new to you. But I think we're going to have to, in the long term, replace the genomic evaluation model that we're currently using. And one possibility would be a hierarchical model in which part of the model relates a haplotype layer to an unobserved gene activity layer, which would be informed by prior probabilities of variance influencing gene product function or gene expression level. And the default assumption would be that variants not in the immediate region of a gene affect the gene only through their own gene products. The second part of the model relates gene activity layer to the phenotypic layer of many traits with priors based on physiological gene networks and other concepts from systems biology. The gene activity layer would not be trait specific and would be informed by low pass RNA sequencing of many tissues under various conditions and also by proteomics, metabolomics, low pass metagenomics and other physiological indicator traits. The low pass RNA sequence data could then replace some of the coverage requirement for low pass genomic sequence. And under this approach, dominance and epistasis would be expressed at the gene activity layer. This approach reduces the dimensions of the parameter space and incorporates many additional sources of information relative to the current model in which each variant is potentially and separately related to each trait. I'm sure there are many other uh, possibilities for ways to improve the uh, genomic evaluation model, many of them probably have not yet been thought of. One of the reasons I think we're going to have to reevaluate our approach to genomic evaluation is the P much greater than N problem that Larry alluded to in his part. What that is essentially is that the number of parameters that we need to estimate, which is denoted by P, is much greater than the number of observations denoted by N that are available to help us estimate those parameters. So in the context of genomic evaluation, what that means is that we have many times more marker effects than we have animals. It's, this problem is sometimes also called overfitting or model overfitting. And if it's not accounted for, it causes predictions to appear much more accurate than they really are. There are many ways to deal with it. They're pretty technical, so we won't cover them here. Uh, this was a serious problem in the early days of genomic EPDs based on SNP chips, especially when we had 50,000 marker effects to estimate and many breeds had only a thousand or a few thousand animals genotyped with those 50,000 markers. It's become much less of a concern recently as several breeds now have substantially more animals genotyped than uh, there are SNP available for inclusion in the model, and there are also arguments that the genomic evaluation models currently being implemented are not susceptible to this problem. But as we consider selecting markers from tens of millions of candidates, P much greater than N is going to reemerge as a, a problem that we have to deal with. Nonetheless, our best chance to improve accuracy is to consider all variants so we will have to return to dealing with the P much greater than N problem. Finally, in 2015, I presented a poster arguing that successful widespread utilization of what's now referred to as low-pass sequencing was dependent on technological advances in two areas. First is cost-effective methods for construction of sequencing libraries, and second is the algorithms, data structures, and software to efficiently impute low-pass data to genomic sequence throughout populations. I remain as convinced as I was then that those are the two impediments to implementation, and I'm really encouraged that although much work remains to be done, Warren demonstrated substantial progress on both fronts and that low-pass is competitive. I am really optimistic that there, is, that there are immense opportunities to make further progress on both of those fronts. So in conclusion, there's far more information in an incomplete and imperfect view of the majority of the genome, which is represented by low-pass sequencing, than there is 
in a near perfect view of a minute fraction of the genome whereas we can get through of Iowa and Iowa State University are proud to host the 2021 Beef Improvement Federation Annual Research Symposium and Convention. The convention will be located in downtown Des Moines with easy access to the airport, hotels, and local restaurants. Iowa State University is just north with its research and teaching farms. Join us in Iowa and experience how Iowa provides the beef industry with innovation to application. <music>